Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Today, we're going to be chatting about Marie de Vignerot, a 17th century French aristocrat, the niece and heir of Cardinal Richelieu, who played an extremely important role in French history and yet has been largely forgotten. Here to discuss is Bronwyn McShay, the author of the first ever biography of Marie de Vignerot, La Duchesse, which we're going to discuss today. She earned her bachelor's and her master's in theology at Harvard and her PhD at Yale. She was a fellow here at the Madison program from 2018 to 2020. And she's also the author of Apostles of Empire and very, very recently, Women of the Church. So with no further ado, I hope you enjoy this discussion. Bronwyn, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thanks, Annika. It's great to be here. So to kick us off here, you've written this lengthy biography about this uh, French woman, Marie de Vignerot, who none of us have ever heard of. Mm-hmm. Why does it matter that people know who she is? Well, uh, as I try to demonstrate in the book, uh, she was one of the most influential, powerful, I th- and I think interesting women of the 17th century, and one of the more interesting figures in that whole century. She was very important to French history in an era famous for the rise of absolutism and and other important historical uh, uh, developments. And she sort of got written out of the French story uh, in mm. the 19th and 20th centuries. And yeah, she was just astonishingly important, interesting person who belongs in historical narratives of her time. Let's kind of mm-hmm. start mm-hmm. with what are the big things that she did that mm-hmm. were really impactful and mm-hmm. then what you know, what was taken out later? How was it possible sure. to edit her out? Sure. Well, um, the big things that she accomplished, um, different stages of her life, she was the niece of the Cardinal Duke de Richelieu, who's the mm-hmm. prime minister of France under um, King Louis XIII. And he's one of the most significant figures in French history. And she was basically his right hand for a number of years. She, she kind of represented him to other people when he wasn't at court. Mm-hmm. People came to her uh, looking for favors from Cardinal Richelieu. So she sort of f- fulfilled this unofficial role mm. as one of the gatekeepers of the Richelieu administration. And that's when she was young. As she sort of came into her own, she um, became a major literary patroness, mm. art- artistic patroness um, of important figures like Pierre Corneille, one of the great playwrights uh, of the 17th century. And then um, once Richelieu had uh, passed away and, and given her a tremendous fortune, one of the largest fortunes in all of Europe. She, um, it's not too much to say that she kind of directed the buildup of the French church and mm-hmm. charitable institutions and its kind of global reach in the 17th century at a time when the French uh, Catholics were establishing missions in various continents around the world, both in connection with colonialism and not in connection with colonialism. So she she had kind of a global reach to her uh, accomplishments in a way that's rather intriguing and unusual to see for a lay figure, let alone a lay woman who is not a monarch, who's not right. kind of one of the princes of Europe. So among other things, so which we can get into some more details. Yeah. Let's start with, I'm going to start by talking about what happened when Richelieu mm-hmm. was alive and mm-hmm. then after he died. But let's first mm-hmm. take a step mm-hmm. back. Some of us uh, have not had the pleasure of learning about Richelieu since AP European history. Sure. Uh-huh. And so let's kind of take a step back. Why does it matter so much that um, Marie de Vignerot was so helpful or influential on Richelieu? Mm-hmm. What was kind of his role within France? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, several things. I mean, he... he uh, developed a very high idea of the, the French monarchical state, um, mm. that po- politics was about advancing the interests of the French state with the king as kind of the representative of uh, the French people and French interests. And um, he did various things with regard to the tax system, with regard to disciplining noble families that encouraged 
the creation of what begins to really look like the modern French state. Mm -hmm. And Louis XIV, uh, the Sun King, um, sort of a, a finished a lot of the um, uh, projects in this vein that Richelieu began. Um, he also kind of helped develop a, a stronger sense of people are not speaking of French nationhood yet. That's kind of right. an 18th century and, and later idea, but a strong sense of French identity, to use a modern phrase that they mm. wouldn't have used, um, associating it with excellent literature, excellent uh, certain art artistic styles, architectural styles, um, and, and um, the sort of glory of French arms, but also culture. So not just kind of a mil military victories and things like that, but it's kind of a, um, an idea that there's a, f a common French culture emerging and that this mm. is part of what the French can give to the world. So uh, things that I think we associate with the, the rise of modern France are are partly being pursued consciously by Richelieu um, as the king's own right-hand man, but chief advisor kind of um, basically ruling the country uh, behind closed doors right. uh, on behalf of the king. So um, I come at this from a French history background, so right. it's kind of established in my mind how important Richelieu is. So um, <laughs> presenting like why he's important, say, to Americans in yeah, the 21st yeah, yeah, century yeah, is, yeah, is another course. question. Um, so, you know, I try to explain some of this in the book and, and right. get into that. But um, that that's at least a start. Yeah, no, yeah. of course. Well, so, so then I guess then the sort of obvious follow up mm -hmm. is so how was Marie helping. Well, I guess, mm -hmm, sorry, mm -hmm. take one step further back sure. than that. How does it come to be the case that Marie mm -hmm. is, especially, as you say, as a lay woman, is doing so much to help her uncle mm -hmm. in his designs in France? And what are kind of some of the tangible impacts that she has? Right. So two quick uh, points of context. Um, this was a, d a day when, the, like, the courts of the kings, the queens, certain high-ranking dukes, mm -hmm. and some of the informal... Um, patronage relationships between the sort of great figures, people working in different roles in their courts, uh, really affected political decisions because um, th th there's kind of, um, it's hard to describe it. I, I kind of describe the world as it's happening, as it right. takes place. But um, personal networks, patronage networks were very central to to the development of, of, of political schemes and military schemes and cultural schemes uh, um, by government officials um, and members of the the French monarchy, um, uh, royal family and, and aristocracy in general. So, um, and then early on in Richelieu's career, King Louis XIII was very young and um, his mother, um, his mother, the queen was, uh, kind of the ruler of France. This is Marie de Medici. She was the regent. And so the, the women's court was actually quite a, a, a crucial power center. There was a separate mm. court for the, the queen and her her entourage. And, and a lot of the power politics were happening at the queen's court mm. uh, while her son was young. Um, and so um, there is a... Uh, his niece... Uh, so his niece was his widow, his, his excuse me, his his widowed brother's brother-in-law's child. His his sister had died young, mm. and he um, kind of raised Marie from her late teen years forward. Like he he was her main protector. He became mm. kind of a father figure. Now he was a cardinal of the church. He's a bishop uh, before that, um, but he enters into this highly political role, the kind of leading mm. advisor of the king, and. He does not have a wife. He doesn't have a daughter. Um, and having a very close, trusted female family member who could mm. sort of have a high position at the at the queen's court um, was his was a real sort of anchor into the the life of the royal family. And so she, he, and she kind of I don't want to use the word scheme because it develops <laughs> over time. Like she, she she sort of learns how to serve the interests of his projects, the Richelieu family. And projects she cares about, initially in the role of one of the leading ladies in waiting to the queen mother. Now, I had before going into this project, I had kind of a, I don't know, like a, an old, like I used to read a lot of historical fiction mm -hmm. when I was younger, and you know, I liked when I was a young girl. I liked stories of princesses and courts, and I always thought of being a lady in waiting, uh, in, uh, not in a very political way, right. uh, but it could be a highly politically important role. And so, anyway, that's kind of going into a lot of detail there, but... Um, no, please. Talk, I, I think, talk more about that. Yeah, I think so. So 
that's how she was able to become important to him politically was right. partly through this relationship to the queen mother and then um, to several other powerful women uh, in French political life. And then um, she essentially, I, I mean, they would not have used this phrase over time as he becomes more powerful, partly with her assistance, like mm. in this courtly role, um, she serves what looks a little bit like the role of a lady, uh, excuse me, a first lady. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's not a prime minister position in the modern sense, uh, like a, a kind of constitutional role for a prime minister, the way it developed in the English state. So he's the leading minister of the king, but he's in, in actuality, he's serving the role of something like a prime minister and, hmm. and representing the king um, in various contexts of French uh, political life, and um, so she, and she is essentially serving a, a function similar to a first lady to that role, which is mm -hmm. a politically important role in in certain times and places. So, so I think that that's at least a start. I love the observation mm -hmm. that you make about how. Um, most of us don't think of being a lady in waiting mm -hmm. as very political. Mm -hmm. You associate mm -hmm. it with like dresses and shoes exactly. and that kind right. of thing. And, but it's also kind of funny because in the book, you do point out that learning how to dress appropriately mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff was something very important that Marie mm -hmm. learned at court. Is that kind of stuff political in this French context? And how can a lady in waiting be a political role? Right. I think um, so. If you're the queen mother and you're essentially the regent of the country or you are the uh, as the king comes of age, the queen is, still has a tremendous amount of influence on her son, and they, they have a kind of volatile relationship. Right. He, he's annoyed <laughs> at his overbearing mother, and they eventually have this dramatic um, moment where she's pushed out of political life, and Richelieu mm -hmm. helps with this, um, and, and Marie is very glad because that she and the queen mother over time do not necessarily get along very well. <laughs> but early on, she's asked to... When you're helping dress the queen, or in Marie's case, she was mistress of the garde-robe, the, uh, the wardrobe of the right. queen. So she's guarding all her jewels, her, her hats, her cloaks, her dresses. That doesn't sound that important. But that she had um, access to many times she was in control of who had keys to the queen's hmm. bedchambers and private spaces. And she and several other women uh and they're they're very competitive the noble families as, as to who gets these roles because you're with the queen right who in some cases is, is leader of the country um in her most intimate private moments right. when she's being herself and you know telling stories about growing up as a medici or complaining about her husband uh how he treated her like you're learning kind of some of the mm. secrets of the royal family, you're with them a lot. And so it, it, it can be a very highly political role when politics is run by uh, these personalities, right? So, um, and it's very coveted. And so positions in the royal household, Richelieu began to fund the salaries of some of these women mm. at the court and also other royal officials. This was one way that you gained influence at court was to actually help the royal family um, pay the salaries of various officials in the royal household. And so um, some of the nobles with influence would try to compete over how many and which particular people close to the king or queen or other members of the royal family uh, were were loyal to them. So hmm. getting Richelieu loyalists into the court was, was a very important political uh, project. And wow. Marie helped with that. She would help vet which women were trustworthy uh, which would sort of serve interests of, of um, Richelieu and, and herself and other people, as well as be loyal to the state. So, um, yeah. So anyway. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing that strikes me is a little bit unconventional mm -hmm. about the story, like mm -hmm. sort of the early life portion, mm -hmm. at least from the way that we think now is usually you think of someone, OK, I've raised this person as my daughter so now you're sort of a mentor to her, you're helping her, mm -hmm. and instead it's very much a two-way, they kind of help each other in court. And in fact, despite being kind of the junior of the partnership, mm -hmm. she becomes very indispensable to him. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that develops over time. Yeah. Because initially, understandably, and this would have been true a century or two later too in, right. a, in a courtly context, Richelieu's main hope, partly, one of his main hopes in positioning his niece in this very central role was was that she would marry someone very high ranking, possibly mm. even the king's brother. 
um, Gaston, the Duke d'Orléans, and that was. He always there was a denial that that was a project he was engaged in. We don't have necessarily <laughs> hard evidence that, that that's what he was doing, but um, marriages. I mean, aristocratic women. One of their primary functions, obviously, right. in this society, which was patriarchal, despite having very powerful women like Marie uh, emerge, um, is that who they marry and who their children are 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 key to their their right. role. He did. Uh, have her marry very young. She was 16 um, before he was uh, very powerful at all. While he was still rising to power, um, he helped arrange her marriage to a nobleman she barely knew. Mm. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but <laughs> she ends up becoming a widow. I won't say when exactly, but but um, um, and so she's a young wealthy widow when she is put in the the uh, position right. of the second highest ranking lady in waiting at court, and so. He hoped she would then have another great marriage, potentially to a, a, a very powerful prince. Mm. Um, but she resists this, and she starts serving this role of helping him and representing him, kind of just naturally by just being. She was very intelligent. She kind of mm. followed his. She was interested in various things he was up to, and um, it took him a while, I think, to recognize this. Mm. There's one letter I I refer to in the book. I forget how old she was exactly, but she's already been serving this role a little bit, and she overhears some serious political gossip that makes her feel like uh, one of the projects he is trying to ensure happens at court goes forward, and she she basically conveys through his top secretary this political gossip that she's heard, mm. and he responds to his his secretary, women should say out of these political matters and at this point she has already like proven her her role uh, her her value to him and so to see him kind of backtrack uh but then it's not long after this that he raises her up instead of her brother she had a brother who i think he wanted to serve this um a much more major role than he Mm -hmm. did and to inherit his dukedom and all that her brother kind of was not very intelligent, was a, a spendthrift. He just mm. didn't, he was not trustworthy. So Richelieu over time develops this relationship with her a bit begrudgingly because she's not fulfilling <laughs> the functions that she's supposed to. But then right. he dr- kind of dramatically decides, okay, that doesn't matter. We're going to do this a different way than is conventional. Um, and I'm going to leave most of the power to her instead of her brother hmm. and, and wealth and all that. So, so I think by the time he's close to his death, he really understands how valuable she is and and treats her a bit more like an equal um yeah anyway so that's that's yeah yeah yeah. some of the story there Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's sort of interesting because i mean i think sort of from a feminist standpoint you're Mm -hmm. like wow that's sort of a lot of personal agency for women at the time Mm -hmm. um at the same time she's a super super religious figure which is something that you Mm -hmm. dwell on a Mm -hmm. lot Mm -hmm. in the book um even kind of at this young age are those you know that kind of female agency going outside the bounds of her mm-hmm. kind of tr- what her traditional role would have been refusing well I'm, I'm sort of spoiling the book That's refusing okay. to get married <laughs> we'll, <laughs> refusing we'll <try>. to get married <laughs> yeah um mm-hmm. does that kind of come into conflict from a faith perspective um i wouldn't i'm not sure i would put it in those terms so this is a uh, a time so the French royal family is Catholic. Right. There's a bit more tolerance of certain high-ranking Protestant nobles uh, in the era of Richelieu than mm. you might imagine. France has recovered from the wars of religion. Um, Protestants are allowed to hold certain positions in government at this point, but there's still some Catholic Protestant conflict going on right. in parts of the country. So the the most of the leading families are at least in name very devoutly Catholic, but at the very same time there was a uh, a renewal going on mm. after the the Catholic Counter Reformation uh, that was affecting Catholic women, many of them at court, and they're becoming very kind of um, more focused on um, they would they were called les les devotes, the devout women. Um, they would get engaged more hands on in charitable mm. service. They engaged in, in kind of more rigorous prayer routines, and mm. and um, there was a bit of a split. Like some of the more worldly women at court and men at court kind of made fun of sometimes these devout figures. And um, 
Marie, who becomes a duchess, she's kind of very associated with these devout women early on. Mm. Um, but she kind of straddles both of these worlds. Mm. And and so there's a lot of, there are various women kind of taking on unconventional roles, um, affecting social, um, trying to affect social reform and various things in, in the country. And so she is, I, I don't, I'm sort of losing my thread here. She wanted to be a nun at one point, right. then is not becoming a nun. And her, I think her faith in some ways gave her, inspired her independent spirit because mm. she's already part of a group that's kind of breaking some of the norms um, socially. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think it's 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 a both and I, I think it, it, it's it, it was certainly much more normal to for a lay woman to get married and to she faced a lot of gossip, the fact that she did not right. remarry. And this right. was a, um, a struggle for her in some ways. So, yeah, I think she's both drawing a lot of her independence from her very strong, devout faith, but it's also coming into conflict with certain people's ideas of what a devout Catholic laywoman in this position should be like. Mm. So, I'm happy that you discussed it that way, because mm -hmm. I think there's kind of two different ways of looking at the plot line here, mm -hmm. so to mm -hmm. speak. I mean, I think there's sort of a feminist version mm -hmm. that she didn't get married, don't need no man. Mm -hmm. She created a role for herself where there wasn't one already. She was super, super um, engaged outside of traditionally female spheres. And then there's a version that, well, she started off so religious. She really wanted to become a nun. Mm -hmm. She wasn't really interested in marriage. She really wanted to pursue a religious vocation that was sort of separate from the ways of this world mm -hmm. and instead was essentially forced at gunpoint to join court and learn mm -hmm. all everything about dresses and scheming right. and all the rest of this. And that it's sort of a downfall of a person who otherwise might have been kind of separate from a feat French society. Mm -hmm. So uh, among kind of those two ways of looking at her story, is there some way to harmonize them or is there one that's more true than the other? Yeah, I mean, I try to just present the facts as I see them. And I yeah. think she evolves over time. I was working against uh, a kind of maybe a, a way that I would answer this. There, there were some 19th century uh, narratives about her. So I said she was written out of history, but mm. she was partly her legacy kind of got dampened because the one other biography of her written before mine, right. published in 1879, was by right. a pious Catholic uh, aristocrat who saw her importance and he wanted people to know about this great woman in French history. But he, um, partly based on evidence and scare quotes that I could not find anywhere in the archives. And I, I think he may have made up some things, like a papal bull. I don't know. I, I mean, forgive me if, if he's up there listening, um, if, if he, it just got lost. Um, but I think in the 19th century, for a Catholic aristocrat, there are actually in some ways stronger, more narrow uh, possibilities for a devout mm. laywoman in his mind. And I think he was more troubled by the idea of a long-term widow who does not mm. become a nun when she's free to than even in the 17th century mm. um, that she and some of her friends would have been. And so I, he, he tries, he interpreted her life as kind of the fruit of a frustrated Carmelite religious vocation. Mm. And she certainly was drawn to the Carmelites and drew a lot of um, sustenance from Carmelite spirituality after spending a lot of time as a young woman with uh, nuns at a convent in Paris um, and being mentored by an, an, an older nun who she believed should be considered a saint. Um, but as I, I, so I started with that narrative and I, but I, as a good historian is supposed to not necessarily right. just right, assume right. that it's true. And so I, I was looking for data on both sides of that. And I just was struck that the story that I see is someone who is very in, intense in her religious devotion mm. privately at one point really wanted to become a nun, but she kind of accepted maybe the role of divine providence, we might describe it. Like her uncle mm. asked her to, to play this role. She didn't necessarily want to do this. It took her several years to acclimatize to this and she starts to be good at it and she starts mm. to enjoy uh, enjoy the position she has and she starts to love fine dresses and jewels <laughs> and she not only likes dinner parties she becomes one of the great hostesses in Paris mm. at a time when this is kind of a new thing for for aristocrats outside the court to be hosting grand events and so she starts to kind of 
realize things about herself in this more worldly role. But that fundamental uh, sense of devotion, I think, really helped her refine what kinds of people she wanted to promote through this worldly environment and what kind of projects she believed in and what kind of men she refused to marry <laughs> who presented themselves to her. Or uh, So it, it, it affected a range of her decisions within this mm. world. And so I think she maintained, a, was trying to maintain kind of an integration of these two things and would be the first to admit that maybe she sometimes failed at that. But mm. I think that was her, her hope uh, most of her life. So, mm. yeah. And so one more question about Richelieu mm -hmm. before we kind of move on to after mm -hmm. he dies. But I think one thing that kind of struck me about it is that they seem like they're pretty different people. Mm -hmm. That Marie is, I mean, for one thing, quite a bit more devout than him. She sort of came across a little bit more sensitive and hesitant. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, you know, overall, when you look at, at their relationship, I mean, given that it seems like his sort of natural political chops were so mm -hmm. much stronger than hers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, how do they develop kind of that close relationship? Would you say that it was that their strengths kind of reinforced each other's? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a big question. Um, I sometimes a question like that. I'm, I'm so like sometimes I, you know, when you're deep in the details of a book, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can yeah. almost miss the forest that you've created for the trees that you put <laughs> together in the forest in the book. I think um, she did have good political instincts. She, uh, she very, I think she very much was her her uncle's protege, and her mm. like she was very good at cultivating political networks and private networks that served um, interests that both she and her uncle believed in. Like she, she actually helped him build up his network in some ways, mm. which was very critical to how he uh, became powerful and maintained power and was able to kind of push out various. Uh, enemies, perceived enemies from what he was doing. Um, but in terms of, um, he was devout in his own way. I mean, he, the irony is that he is a churchman, right? right? right, right. He was a, a priest and a bishop and then a, a cardinal. Um, but he had, he was a bit more comfortable with kind of worldly enjoyments. He was less sort of troubled. Uh, mm -hmm. She had a more, her conscience, I think, was more pricked uh, uh, when it came to you know, indulging in great dinner parties a lot right. or, or um, sort of uh, she she had a, a, an ascetic sensibility like mm. she she had. A, I think he saw that almost in a it's kind of odd to see it in one one letter I found that he wrote to her. Um, he almost seems to have this modern something like a modern aversion to uh, kind of ascetic discipline or kind of a hmm. self-punishing uh, mode that is coming partly out of the man monastic tradition that she's drawn to. And so he, there's some tension there. He wanted her to just kind of enjoy the world a bit more than she did. I think she comes to do right. that. I'm not sure I'm, I'm getting at your question now because no, no, I think their their relationship is so, the part of the problem, it, it was so personal and private. And many of the sources I looked mm. at show, like you have known uh, times when they were together they probably were conversing, but we do not have records, transcripts of these private conversations. Right. He very quickly um, saw her as one of the few people he could truly trust, and he was he was he did not trust many people. Hmm. He was, um, I mean, he he was so focused on his political agenda to the point that most people found him very cold and calculating. Hmm. Sort of the famous Im image of Richelieu was this cold, calculating, almost bloodless, right, political, right, right. Uh, mastermind, right? But he, he, in front of his niece, uh, he, he actually suffered from depression. It wow. seems he cried a lot. Like she saw a side of him that was very, very human. They shared enjoyments, and so I think they, they had a true family bond that was quite mm -hmm. strong. And so I think they worked out these differences the way you do with any close family member. You kind of learn to kind of play off each other and, and live with some of some of the differences or different points of view. Um, they were so close, in fact, that some people speculated there was some sort of unholy relationship right. going on there. So, right. and the gossip mill in that era was terrible. <laughs> I mean, there are like you know, the tabloids in the supermarket right. like, have nothing to uh, right. on, on what people were publishing about powerful people back then. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm I again. Not sure if yeah. I answered the question. No, no, that was very kind of amazing. Also, because in history, you don't always get like an image of people mm -hmm. who are as close as that. And mm -hmm. I think it's a good, mm -hmm. I realized maybe I should have asked this mm -hmm. closer to the beginning, 
but now is as good a time mm-hmm. as any. Like the source material, mm-hmm. what was kind of the state of that? Because it seems like if she was mentioned in so, so many sources, mm-hmm. how would it be possible to kind of erase her from the story? Yeah, that's that's the irony. I think yeah. once I, I... I should clarify for uh, people listening. So typically, I mean, this is a, a bit of a, a caricature of the, the more complicated <laughs> reality, um, but, but typically when you're looking at an early modern female figure in history, right. the kinds of sources you have to rely on are private letters, journals if they survive, mm. if they were literate, and more kind of private materials of a more personal nature. And when you can when you find those treasure troves, it's amazing because it's very it's rare to have. Not that many of her person, not that much of her personal correspondence survived. Mm. I had bits and pieces, or I had the other person's letter to her that survived, or her letters to someone else who saved her letters. She mm. destroyed a lot of her correspondence before wow. she died. So there are big gaps in kind of the what she herself could have told us right. in historical records. And at first I thought that I would not be able to write this book, but I then started, I, I had this hunch. I mean, I follow my hunches sometimes. I started to, I started seeing her referred to in footnotes in hmm. books on all sorts of topics, like the history of missions, the history of charitable projects in Paris, um, the history of like playwrights. And hmm. like she starts to appear in footnotes and sometimes archival sources. And so I just started building up a, kind of a database right. of the kinds of sources. She then, I then start looking for her. Once I realized she was more important than I thought, and then even her first biographer indicated in his footnotes um, and, and some of what he writes about her, I started looking for references to her in the memoirs of important figures mm. or the correspondence of people say like Cardinal Mazarin, Richelieu's successor as prime minister. And what I began to find like in the political correspondence of Mazarin, like shocked me. Like mm. he, her importance is very clear to, uh, you know, the successor of Richelieu as, as a prime minister. And I, I, I just started to, once I started looking, it was almost everywhere. It was like hiding wow. in plain sight. But I had to kind of gather it all from various sources, different archives, different libraries, early print books. And it took a long time right. to I'm, build up the source base. But there are a lot of gaps in it. And so right. um, there are parts in the narrative where I, I can't really say what she was thinking or and and um but it, it right. I, I think it ends up being okay like I, I let the reader in on certain moments like that and just right. let them decide based on circumstantial evidence with me so yeah anyway that's pretty amazing <laughs> um yeah I mean especially I don't know I I can understand why it's so frustrating for historians to have her burn her letters but I'm like would <laughs> I have done the same thing probably <laughs> Yeah, who knows why yeah. she did it? I mean, I think part of it, I my again, my gut tells me some of it was to was yeah. um, secrets of her uncles and maybe right. her own. She did not want posterity to know about. Um, right. And um, there is, I maybe won't go into this, but she did have a strong love interest in her life. Right. And, and I, I suspect right. some of those were just um, she wanted to keep private. Right. And um, a, a frustrated love interest. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. So I think she was private. She didn't necessarily want certain details about her life left right. for her her kind of not all her relatives who inherited her money liked her or right. liked the, so i i don't think she wanted her relatives to find some of this material and, and do oh. bad things with it so that is well, yeah <laughs> timeless yeah yeah so. uh, but it's also i mean a good transition because we sort of talk about after Richelieu's death when she begins mm-hmm. kind of all these charitable projects it's kind of amazing i mean you point to some really big names that everyone would know mm-hmm. pascal descartes where she had a really big impact on yeah. why they kind of were able to rise to prominence can you talk a little bit about that yeah i think um i would qualify descartes i i, I think she helped him it's, the evidence <laughs> is not quite as strong as pascal she knew blaise pascal and his sisters when they were very right. young she helped mentor them and she helped um pascal's father was kind of kicked out of the french <laughs> court for a while because he had gotten on the wrong side of the administration and she kind of artfully finds a way right. to bring them back into the scene there um she uh on a the side of charitable projects, um, St. Vincent de Paul is one of the most mm. important French Catholic saints of the 17th century. He, he started the, the Congregation of the Mission, um, priests devoted to serving the poor and, and rural parts of France. They are connected to the Daughters of Charity, of this kind of innovative 
uh, um, Institute for Women. And um, in, in, in older books on Vincent de Paul, uh, he is depicted as this charismatic priest who kind of won over pious widows like the Duchess of Aguillon, Marie de Vigneron. Mm. And what I found is she kind of helped make, make she helped him make Vincent de Paul. She was one of his most important patrons. There are a number of other leading Catholic clergymen at the time that she she was their patron, not vice yeah. versa. Like yeah, she helped yeah. make the career of several important bishops, some of them in mission territory, some in, in France. Um the, the range of characters uh, in, in, in the sense of a story that, that she helped make their careers or or helped kind of guide them into projects that they became famous for historically is, is kind of amazing. So, um, yeah, and it, it, it sort of illustrates the importance of patronage in this in this time period and yeah. how a woman's patronage uh, could do a tremendous amount, even even if that woman could not serve in a political role per se, uh, like in, in, in a governmental position, or of course she could not be a bishop, obviously, right. in the Catholic Church. Um, but it illustrates also the, the power that certain lay figures had as well. Like we, mm. we think of the bishops as somehow telling the lay people what to do. And it, in many ways, it was it was the opposite in this period. Right. Um, sometimes pious networks of and not so pious networks of lay <laughs> elites um, were kind of orchestrating what's happening with with the church uh, and and various projects that are famous from church history in the time. So you just have to sort of look from a different angle and you start to see it. So when you look at, I mean, some of these, given kind of how devout she was, Mm -hmm. Pascal makes Mm -hmm. perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, There was also a female mathematician she Mm -hmm. helped. Marie Crew, yes. Right, Mm -hmm. which is sort of less kind of central given sort of Mm -hmm. her religious interests. And then she's wading into, I mean, some plays that were pretty controversial Mm -hmm. at the time, um, which was kind of surprising to me because you sort of were like, well, maybe she's a little bit, you know, tightly wound when it comes to the religious element is maybe something you would assume. And yet some of these plays were kind of subverting expectations about the way that plots would unfold in, in plays, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. sort of unusual for the time. Mm-hmm. Is there something that kind of particular interests that sort of bind together what she chooses to to be a patroness of? Yeah, I think, well, so an example of one of these plays is yeah. uh, Pierre Corneille, uh, Le Cid, the story of the Spanish folk hero, medieval folk hero, El Cid. Um, it, it was controversial at, at the Academy Francaise, which her uncle founded the, you know, the yeah. gatekeepers of excellent French literature and language. And um, she helped Voltaire in the 18th century actually credits Marie de Vignerot for wow. making the career of Pierre Cornet. Um, so Voltaire knew she was important, but then, <laughs> then it's sort of forgotten the next century. But um, the one of the things, this is not necessarily a, a, a kind of point of principle binding everything mm. together, but some of the projects she's supporting, the, the way... Some of the controversial plays and and poet poetry and other things were a little bit fashionable. Some of these styles at the Spanish court. Ah. Um, some of the spirituality that she favored, the Carmelite spirituality, was coming partly out of the Spanish scene. She had um, some Spanish influences on her from some of the nuns that that uh, mentored her, and also Marie de Medici was. Um, She's a Medici and a Habsburg and is tied to the court of Spain. And so there's there's a bit of, um, there are cultural currents happening that she just enjoys. And they're partly coming from similar influences on her life. Mm. And and she just seemed to have this, um, whether it's, you know, a book promoting greater ideas of the equality of men and women, their capability, which is kind of radical, like radical to see her promote books like that right one of them written by a a, a monk actually so mm-hmm. like there, there were religious figures promoting kind of more um what we might describe as radical ideas for the time that she's patronizing or whether she's promoting a charitable project that's strongly driven by a, a kind of uh deeply christian sense of seeing christ and other people and, right. and living more like christ uh, in the world um i it, it's it's um I, I i don't think she saw these things as in conflict the way some people in mm. her time did so um yeah i don't know there's an an independent ability for she had this independent spirit an ability to kind of mm. weave these things together in a way that made sense to her without she didn't like sort of 
conventional boxes, I guess. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, she promotes very conventional uh, modes of life for some of her young nieces and nephews. Mm. Like she, she's she has a conservative instinct in terms of what she promotes among other young women. Like she doesn't think all young women should not get married, like she did. Right. And so she has a lot of tensions, I guess. And mm. I think my job as a biographer is not to actually tie all these things together, but just to present who she was as the sources show us. And um, so I sometimes get a little uncomfortable with questions like, <laughs> how do I sum her up? Because because that's right. in a way that's I'm going a little bit beyond my ken there, right. beyond my role. Right, right, right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting also, you know, you sort of referred at the very beginning of this interview mm-hmm. to the global impact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's kind of amazing because it's right at the outset of when it was even possible to have a global impact, mm-hmm. which is yeah. easy to forget that, mm-hmm. I mean, a hundred years previously, you, that that wasn't a thing. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like a European impact. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also something that today people look back on and have mixed feelings sure, about, mm-hmm. um, and probably would not describe the typical kind of French colonial project as mm-hmm. um, community service, which is definitely the yes. way that Marie thinks about it. Right. Right. So, can you talk a little bit about her involvement in the New World? Yeah. So I should. I, I want to actually, if I. Could, quickly sketch out so she yeah. was she was very tight so the french were getting involved in the colonization of parts of north america so new right. france they were beginning to appear in the caribbean they were um they had some aspirations to colonial ventures elsewhere including uh, like the island of madagascar off of uh, southern africa but they also had diplomatic and trade relationships with uh places in Southeast Asia, right. in North Africa. And she has projects in basically every location where the French are wow. expanding either commercially or colonially, which are not always the same thing uh, in this period. So the French are kind of latecomers to building a colonial empire. And it's a lot of places, though. I yeah, mean... it's a lot. And, it's, and she actually <laughs> was, impressive. she actually had some ties to some of the merchant companies. Um, I looked, I, I dutifully looked to see if she made any profits from the slave trade. I couldn't find anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean that she did not. So I, I, I like to kind of be forthright about that because obviously it's an issue people care about a lot. Um, but she, so the French, um, everywhere the French send colonists or merchants or fur traders, they are also sending missionaries in, right. in, North, in North America. It was initially the Jesuits primarily. And the Jesuits kind of, recognize some of the Native American um, populations with whom the French are building trading relationships primarily uh, were suffering from epidemics of smallpox and the like that that had come up from Latin America. The French did not have the modern science. They did not know that all this disease was coming from the earlier European waves uh, Mm -hmm. in Latin America. So when they arrived in North America, there was an assumption that these populations were just very poor and sick and dealing with a lot of problems. And so that there was an initial concern to build some hospitals, to build mm. institutions that would actually assist some of the native populations that the French are engaged in pretty friendly trading relationships with primarily. Right. And she sponsors the first charitable hospital, and it's devoted to Native Americans, not to the French population uh, in Quebec, the first charitable hospital north of Spanish America. And she also establishes similar charitable hospitals in North Africa and several other locations. Um, but she's also um, involved with other other charitable projects in mission settings that are either tied to the French colonialism or tied to French diplomatic or merchant ventures. So um, I guess that sort mm-hmm. of sum- summarizes it quickly. Is there a reason why she had such an affinity with the Jesuits specifically? Because they would have been a pretty young order at the time. Yeah, right? well, they've been around actually since the uh, 1540s. Um, okay. She had, a, I, I think, the affinity at the beginning was simply that they were the most engaged in mission work right. in the 1630s when she starts to kind of become interested in global projects. This right. is before Richelieu died. So um, she actually... The, the Jesuits actually liked other orders to get involved where they could. And mm. so she sponsors Augustinian women. Some of the first mm. female missionaries wow. in history go and join Augustinian canonesses, the hospital sisters. They go to Quebec. Um, over time, though, she doesn't work that much with Jesuits. She, I, mm. I think St. Vincent de Paul and his Congregation of the Mission, um, 
the Daughters of Charity. She was a lady of charity involved with lay women, involved with charitable service. Mm. She promoted their projects. Um, she actually helped build up secular clergy, secular meaning um, diocesan clergy uh, who were under the authority, of, direct authority of a bishop. So they're parish priests, not priests from religious orders. Uh, she helped set up some d missionary diocese in Southeast Asia and one in North America. And so she actually builds up the secular clergy in mission settings. And she's one of the major founding figures of a French foreign mission society that is still active in Paris today uh, mm. that trains parish clergy for, for mission work or charitable work in different global settings. So, so she actually worked with a, a wide variety of orders and mm. kinds of clergy and kinds of religious and also lay people. So what, what's really striking about her, there's an affinity with the Jesuits because it's just right. like inevitable if you're interested in missions in this period, right. but also she diversified her resources. Mm -hmm. and I think was, she had almost an investor's way of looking <laughs> at the spiritual life and charitable wow. projects. She liked to diversify in case some of these things fail. So then you have different uh, kinds of things going on that promote French interests, Catholic interests, and so on uh, mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, so to kind of close us out here, mm -hmm. um, so I was just in France a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. And one of the, I mean, I'm a grumpy ancient history person <laughs> who's not at all interested in any sites that kind of, you know, had to do with the French Revolution. Sure, sure. And yet you really cannot avoid it. Yes. It's everywhere. Because like every church you go to, if it's medieval, mm -hmm. if you go to, you know, great houses, all of this stuff, there's immediately a story, what happened to this during the revolution, mm -hmm. so much was destroyed, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I guess kind of from that angle, when you look overall at Marie's life, to me, you're like, wow, um, there's so much kind of going on here. And yet it's so close to just the total fall, yeah. the total destruction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess knowing as we do know how the story ends, mm -hmm. um, are there kind of seeds that you see of that in the, the way that the French court worked that you see in Marie's life? Seeds of the French Revolution coming? Yeah, uh, like, you if, like if, a... you, if we know how it ends and knowing how it ends, yeah. when we look at the story, do we have clues? I think I would I would caution us, because I'm a historian, <laughs> she died more than 100 years yeah. before yeah, yeah. the French Revolution. So she died in 1675. There are some tensions. I mean, the, the centralizing right. power of the monarchical state is happening. Noble families are getting... Uh, there's the Fronde Civil War that happens. Right. And she's involved. Right, right. She's a strong supporter of the monarchical state right. uh, versus some of the princely families that feel like they're getting squeezed out by right. this kind of new bureaucratic kind of mode of governing. Um, the Richelieu family, I mean, Richelieu's idea of the central state, he 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 often tried to represent the interests of sort of the common people. Right. Um, so there was a um, some sense that more ordinary French people should be kind of brought more into the functioning of of uh, French civil life um, and that the princely families sort of had too much kind of independent control. Um, mm. So some there are certain, there are historians who work on this trajectory right. and can sh and show right. you much more uh, clearly and in, in, in a much more articulate way than I can certain things that are happening in her period that are part of the the trajectory that that brings us toward the uh, right. mid 18th century uh, right. crisis that starts developing, but um, you really don't see it. Uh, like it, it's it's really not there. And I, what struck me is just how complex and right. almost like an unknown country right, her right, world right. is. Like when you focus on a figure, and and there are lots of things I assumed about her time period that doing this project made me question. Um, and so I think that where the revolution really comes in, though is not sort of what you can see in her her time predicting might what might happen later mm -hmm. but it, it helps explain why she was forgotten right so one key thing she had several the Richelieu family had several great palaces that actually the royal family envied and one of them the Chateau de Roy uh, west of Paris was envied by Louis XIV he tried to buy it from her and she said no and she she was one of the only people who could say no to Louis XIV and get away <laughs> with it that palace was destroyed after the French Revolution. Um, it's it, it was brick by brick was sold to people, wow. you know, wanted to, you know, use the materials for other building projects. So there were these 
kind of impoverished noble families that were connected to some of these properties and they their their palaces were destroyed just to to gain some you know some money in the new era right and there are some the carmelite convent where she was over time it got demolished uh after several different revolutions in france and the this sort of old regime structures that she was attached to just mm. got sort of literally buried by wow. history and so you don't see there's no physical memory of pla certain places that were very important to her mm. one of the few that exists is the the petit luxembourg a mansion in paris right. where the president of the french senate resides and has his offices today and it's very you can't so and people know that there's some connection to Napoleon at that building, right. but the plaque on the outside of this building doesn't mention her as one of its famous former residents. Hmm. And um, I, I somehow was able to arrange a private wow. visit to this building thanks to a friend who knows a French senator and to actually be in her home. And part of it is the structure that she lived in. The rooms are the same size and, you know, with updated furniture, obviously. And it's, it's just striking that her main home is still right there in the center of Paris in a, in a leading kind of tourist spot, but there's no plaque indicating mm -hmm. anything about her. So, so the revolution and a lot of different changes that happened in France since her time are partly to blame for why she's kind of invisible to many French people today. So, Wow. Well, yeah. that is a great note to end on. Okay. Thank you so much, Brahman. This has been really fun. Thank you so much, Anna. Well, there you have it, Madisonians, Bronwyn McShay, on her book, La Duchesse, The Life of Marie de Vigneron, Cardinal Richelieu's Forgotten Heiress Who Shaped the Fate of France. The book is linked in the show notes, so you should absolutely check it out, as is Bronwyn's most recent book, Women of the Church. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find out more about the James Madison program and everything that we do here on Princeton's campus at jmp.princeton.edu. There, you can learn about our initiatives, sign up for our mailing list, see all the upcoming events that we're hosting here on Princeton's campus, and also find the recordings of all of the previous events that we've hosted over the last several years. You can also find us on social media, on Twitter at Madison Program, as well as on Instagram and Facebook. And last, but certainly not least, please do consider giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it, or leaving us a review. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and I can't wait to see you next week here on Madison's Notes.